great pleasure and honour to have a chance to talk to you, Quentin Skinner. Um, Quentin, when and where were you born? I was born in Chatterton, which is a suburb of Manchester, on the 26th of November 1940, so I'm a Sagittarian, and it's the year of the dragon. Um, so that's the answer. Okay. Tell me, you can go back as far as you like. I had one respondent who went back to Charles Darwin, his great-grandfather, but you don't need to go that far. But ah. Your grandparents or your parents or anyone who's significant in your ancestry would be nice to hear about. Yes. Well, although I was born in England and have lived most of my life in England, um, my family on both sides comes from the northeast of Scotland. My mother's father was a wines and spirit merchant in Aberdeen, and my father's father was a rather more prosperous merchant in Aberdeen. He was a wholesale grocer. He also ran uh, a chain of restaurants. In fact, we still have some of the cutlery. And um, my father was educated in England in the sense that he was trained for the Navy. He was a Conway boy, like Conrad. What's a, what is a Conway boy? Uh, the Conway, along with Dartmouth and others at that time, trained, um, uh, gave a special training that put you into the Navy as a junior officer, as a midshipman. And in fact, my father joined the Royal Navy in the First World War, straight out of his training, and was torpedoed uh, while working um, on the Arctic convoys. So he was in the Navy, but he always told me he hated it. And he came out and took the civil service examinations and joined the colonial service, and then spent the whole of his career in West Africa. My mother went to the University of Aberdeen, as did um, most of my family on both sides. Uh, all three of her brothers and two of her sisters also went to university in Aberdeen. They all read medicine. But my mother uh, graduated in English literature and she became a school teacher. Uh, she was an exact contemporary of one of my father's sisters at university and I think that must be how my parents met. <laughs> Never asked them. No, because this sister was not at all liked by my mother, but I always suspect that, that maybe that was the reason. And I also noticed that they both died quite young, or at least quite a long time ago. Yes, quite a long time ago, although not so much young, because I'm the second child uh, and of quite uh, old parents. Um, my father must have been in his late thirties when he married, and he died in his early eighties. But my mother faded away. She had Alzheimer's disease from, in retrospect, from disease from her early 70s and died in her late 70s. The strangeness to me is that each of my parents died while my wife Susie was pregnant with one or other of our children. Um, my father died when she was pregnant with our daughter, who's now 28, so that was a long time ago. And my mother died when she was pregnant with our son was only two years younger, so mm. they did die a long time ago, yes. Mm. Tell me something about their character, and uh, if it affected your life or their interests. or um. Yes, that's very interesting. Uh, mine is a very common story of the time. That's to say, a father who's employed in the colonial service and who lives abroad. And in the case of the African colonies, he worked in Nigeria the British Foreign Office very strongly discouraged children from going out there. I've never set foot in Africa, although my parents spent much of their lives there. But of course it was endemically malarial then, and the death rate for children would have been very high. So I only saw my parents when they came on leave. And from, fact, from what age? I mean, right well, from the beginning? Or? Right from the beginning. I didn't mm. see my father who was stuck in Africa, of course, by the outbreak of war. Uh, 
uh, for several years. Uh, and then they went back after 1945. And so I then saw them only at intervals of about 18 months. I was really brought up by my mother's eldest sister, who was a doctor in Manchester, maiden lady, um, but with, as it were, strong maternal instincts, who was a wonderful guardian, uh, a very educated woman, a doctor, but also passionate about literature and the drama and the world of the mind generally. But I got to know my parents after my father retired. In those days, he retired from the uh, imperial service at 55. Um, and, you know, he'd been malarial for a long time and was sort of ready to retire. And so at that point, the school which I was attending, where, of course, I'd been a boarder, I was at Bedford School, where I went uh, as a seven-year-old. By then, my parents were back in Africa. And I attended as a boarder until they retired. But then um, I became a day boy. They retired to Bedford. And so I lived with them for the first time in my life. Slightly prematurely, because at prep school I got tuberculosis and very nearly died. And my mother came back in a mighty rush and very prematurely from Africa to look after me and then set up house, and my father retired a couple of years after that. So then I had my adolescence living with them in Bedford. My father, I was very fond of both of them, but he was a very quiet and retiring person. But my mother was very important in my teenage years. She was um, someone who had retained a great passion for English literature. And because they'd been partly in the diplomatic, and the, the language of the diplomatic was French. She also spoke extremely good French, and she gave me a passion for that language, which is still the only other language than English in which I can lecture and teach. So she was important to me. My father I really got to know better in his very old age, when he was looking after my mother when she was so faded out. And I conceived a great admiration for his courage and his stoicism. He was a very fine person. You, s you said this was quite a normal story. Part of the normal story, as in my case, is that being abandoned by people who are in the empire yes. has quite a traumatic effect on a very small child. Yes. Uh, other people have parents and you don't have parents, and especially when you first go to your first boarding school, which may have been Bedford School. Do you remember the loneliness and the crying on your pillow at night stuff, or well, Baba Black Sheep? <laughs> yes. Uh, somehow it was how life was, and children accept that. It is true that I went to boarding school even before I went to Bedford, which had its own mm. prep school, so I went there at the age of seven. But I was a hardened boarder by the time I was seven. Um, it was just how life was. I don't think I questioned it. But I will say that when my own son came to be the age of seven and I looked at him and thought this was the age at which I was sent away to boarding school, I was filled with a great rage which must have been there. Mm. That this was an extraordinary thing to do to such very small children mm. and leave them really absolutely to fend for themselves. Mm. Were you bullied or do you remember? No, not at all. The school... Hazing or anything? Uh, the school was quite tough, but... Um, this is the Bedford School, you mean? This was at Bedford. Mm -hmm. I went, and the as primary I say, school. to its own prep school, and then I went into the middle school, and then into the upper school. So I went at the age of seven, and I emerged at the age of 18. It was tough in the way that those boarding schools were, uh, and I don't think I've ever really quite come to terms with that, I have to say. But I got an excellent education, and in retrospect, I feel... I didn't realise at the time what a very good education I was getting. It stood me in extremely good stead. I think I could have got a very good education in the sciences because my elder brother, who was a very brilliant boy, did do the sciences at Bedford and won the top scholarship to Cambridge in medicine. So he must have been very well taught. But I had a very traditional education 
in that I studied the classics, of course, at prep school, as one did intensively from a very early stage. And then mostly my education was in um, history and in English literature, as well as in the classics. And so those were the subjects that I carried right through to university entrance. And I was excellently taught in all of those subjects. Do you remember any particular teachers who uh, influenced you, or were it just a, a large gang of them? <laughs> no, there were good teachers, uh, and I should say also it was a remarkable peer group. If I think of the boys who were together with me in the lower sixth form before we all spread yeah. out into our specialisms, they were a very remarkable peer group, including people who became very consequential in the world of business, and in academe, one of my closest friends was the founding professor of mathematics at UEA, and in politics, uh, Paddy Ashton was in my form. So if I think back on that group, with several of whom I'm still in contact, I think it was at least as impressive a peer group as I encountered at Cambridge. But you asked about teachers of that group. Um, there was one who absolutely stood out and was, I think, a truly remarkable person. And I never lost that sense because I always remained in touch with him and I last saw him within months of his death, which was only two years ago. And quite remarkably, I think, for a school teacher, his obituary took up a full page in The Independent. And I was one of a number of people who wrote little pieces in that obituary. And some of the other people who were wrote, you really would have heard of, including, of course, Paddy Ashton. This was a man called John Eyre, a Y E Y R E, yeah. very boss class figure, who I think felt he should have been teaching at a somewhat grander school than Bedford, and had certainly been at a grander school. But he was recognizably, in retrospect, a kind of 30s leftist intellectual who'd served as a young guardee in the Second World War. And he was our history teacher, and he knew how to get you a scholarship at Oxford or at Cambridge. He was an Oxford man. But he was also a man passionate about especially poetry, but literature more generally, and theatre, above all the theatre. And that influenced me tremendously. I was never able to act, although I aspired to, and I remember auditioning, actually even from an early age, auditioning with John Eyre. My first audition was as Ophelia. Um, I subsequently auditioned for Hamlet. I never got these parts, which was just as well. <laughs> But um, it gave me a, a passion for the theatre, and especially for poetry. He taught us uh, all the way through the school um, in English literature as well as in history. And he marked me very much. And as I say, I remained in touch with him and never failed to find him a very brilliant and challenging person. Apart from the theatre, which you didn't manage to succeed in, were there other activities. Your tuberculosis presumably precluded you from too much hearty games playing, did it? Or? Well, no, I was completely cured. The reason I'm sitting here, of course, is uh, Alexander Fleming. Mm. Um, I was simply pumped full of penicillin, mm. and in those days you were left mm. to lie on your back for most of a year, which I did. I um, was greatly educated through the BBC, which I listened to all the time, and it turned me into a bookish boy. I mm. sat there for a year, and I read, and I listened to music. That was very formative. It happens that because I'd started my schooling in Scotland, I was very well ahead of the boys in the English prep school. And I was in a class which was of boys who were a year older than me, as well as being the top class. And I was really struggling. So my school days were very much adjusted by my having that year out, because when I returned, I returned to the class in which everyone was my age. And then I had a much greater academic success. But it never stopped me, no. I was a sort of all-rounder. I was um, captain of gymnastics, and I led the school fencing team. Uh, I haven't thought about any of this for many years, <laughs> but I suppose in that kind of school you were enforced to be an all-rounder. My guardian, my aunt, the doctor, absolutely refused that I should box. That mm. would have been expected of me, but she... Mm. rightly, of course, recognised that that was not going to be a good idea for any boy. But I played all the games that mm. one played. Uh, and I was quite a good um, off-break bowler, although I was never a very good batsman. So uh, that was an important aspect, of course, because 
compulsory games was very important in mm. the schools, as I hardly need to remind you. The other thing which mattered a lot to me, and always had, was music. And from an early age I played the violin. Not well. I was not gifted, but I was good enough to be in the school orchestra. And, of course, I liked the fact that that, together with the fact that I was a choir boy at the school, um, taught me to read music and gave me an interest in classical music and in the choral tradition, which has actually remained of extraordinary importance to me all through my life. And although I don't play, and I want to stress I was never a good player, but it matters to me tremendously. A wide range of music or particular? Uh, I have a very conservative aesthetic. Um, the heroes vary. In fact, uh, there was a period when Beethoven would have mattered most, and then Haydn mattered most. Now Bach matters most. Uh, and for a time, Handel. But that is to speak of a very conservative aesthetic. I'm very passionate about some 20th century music, especially the Russian tradition, and I trace that through from Tchaikovsky, as Stravinsky himself did and, of course, Stravinsky, Prokofiev, and Shostakovich. Those are very important figures for me, but I cannot pretend that I have kept up with late 20th century music in anything like the same way. Do you, um, when you mention these different musicians, I, I was the same. There was, some of my books are written to Bach, some to Mozart, some to Handel now. Handel is my great passion, but... Um, I actually write, I mean, I listen to them and then I go and write. Yes. And I noticed later that this is what Maitland did, that he was a great Wagnerian. He called his daughters after Wagner characters. But a lot of his writing has been analysed as having musical overtones. It, Very interesting. And ed, uh, film editors do the same thing. They edit films to music. Yes. Do you think it influences your writing or your thinking directly or is it just a relaxation from it? That's very interesting, and I haven't thought about it. I did at one point have a big change in my life, which is that as a student, I always listened to music while working. At a certain point, silence became extremely important to me, and I'm a bit neurotic about having good silent conditions in which to write. And I cannot listen to music while I'm writing. I sometimes try, if I'm just doing emails mm -hmm. at the end of the day, I might put on a piece of music, but I almost always find that what's happened is I've stopped writing the email <laughs> because I'm listening to the music. Mm. And I can't do the two things. Mm. And I like to think that this is because I'm taking the music seriously. Um, so the answer is I cannot work with music at all. I, I can't either. I don't think, since there weren't such devices in those days, um, I doubt whether Maitland did either, but no. basically you, I listen to music and then a couple of hours later or the next day I write and I notice that the music is going on in the back of my mind and yes. the, the phrasing and the sentence stops and so on yes. is ref sometimes reflecting. That's more what I was meaning rather than listening to it while you were actually writing. Yes, that's a much subtler point. Well, I certainly find, since I listen to music a lot in the evenings, that there's almost always something in my head it's one of the Schubert trios, as it happens at the moment. I can't get it out of my head. There's always something there. Mm. It becomes a nuisance. You can't stop it. Eventually it goes away, and then it's going to be replaced by something else. So that is a continuous haunting mm. that I mm. suffer. And actually it can be a nuisance sometimes. Mm. Uh, and the Schubert, since it's so melancholy and it's so tragic, um, I would quite like it to go away, but I can hear it as I'm talking to you. <laughs> That's very interesting. Okay, well... Um, let's now, you did obviously well at Bedford, and people said, what do they say, you should try for Oxbridge, or what do they say? Yes, well, yes, I won a state scholarship, as they were called in those days, off my A-levels. And then, of course, the idea in those days was you went in for the Cambridge scholarship. But I was interviewed at Cambridge uh, before the scholarship, by a wonderful man called Ian McFarlane, who was the senior tutor. McFarlane? Yes. <laughs> Good. Yes. Spelt the same way as that. Spelt the same way. <laughs> yeah. No, not. Yeah. MC. Um, but he gave me admission to the college. On this the was Gonville and Keys, was it? This was at Gonville and Keys. And he gave me admission there um, on the strength of my A-levels and an interview. 
which was splendid when I came to take the scholarship examination because I didn't absolutely have to get a scholarship. Although John Eyre's teaching in that final term where everyone was groomed for the scholarships was very elitist because, of course, there had to be a third year sixth. But John introduced us then to more general questions about historical interpretation. And we read Croce and we read Collingwood. This has permanently marked me and been very important to me. I won a scholarship, and so I went to Keyes. But the reason I went to Keyes was that my elder brother had been there. And it was a celebrated college then and now for medicine. And I remember persuading my poor old father to write to the senior tutor, saying his elder son had gone to the college because it was thought to be the best for medicine, but his younger son was hoping to read history and would Keyes be a good college? It was, I can see, an impertinent letter. But we were very impressed with the two-line answer from the senior tutor, which said, Dear Mr Skinner, Gordon Keyes College is the best college in all subjects. So <laughs> that was good enough for us. And I went to Keyes, and I was extremely fortunate to go to Keyes, which was already a powerhouse in the teaching of history. Like? Who, who taught you? Well, I was given my admission by Philip Grayson, who was a senior scholar, who only died a year or two ago in his late 90s, who became a lifelong friend. But he was a remote figure, except that he was passionate about most of the same music that I was passionate about. And he was a bachelor don living in the college, and we were encouraged to go and listen to music in his rooms, which I did a good deal. And indeed, he was changing from his old 78s to LPs at that time and gave me a huge number of very classic 78s, including all the Fritz Butch, Mozart, Kleinborn recordings from the 30s. He was a benign but remote presence, but the important presence was the person just appointed, Neil McKendrick, who had a celebrated career as a teacher in the college and spent all his life in the college and eventually became the master. He was our director of studies. He didn't particularly press us at the level of what we should be writing in our essays. I don't remember that he did that, but he gave you a very strong sense that these questions really mattered, and it mattered to think about them. And of course, it mattered to do well in the examinations. He was very keen on that. Also, he was someone who didn't use the old Cambridge system of teaching within the college. He had the revolutionary idea that you should be taught by people who knew about the subject <laughs> in whichever college they happened to be lurking. Mm -hmm. And I already knew that I wanted to work in intellectual history. I wanted to be a teacher. And I came to the university knowing that I wanted to be a teacher. A teacher at university level? Well, I wasn't sure. I had been very much encouraged by my teacher, John Eyre, to leave school instantly after the scholarship, which I did. And I went to teach in a secondary modern school, as they were then called. That's to say, those were the schools for the boys and girls who had failed the 11 plus. And they were put on the shelf by the state. And I went to teach in a, a school of this character in Maidstone. It was quite a tough thing to do in that I was immediately introduced to a world which I didn't know anything about. That's to say, mixed classes, huge classes, and a, a very wide spectrum of ability, although I should say including quite high abilities which were being neglected by the binary system of education that was then in force. And that was a very powerful experience for me. And I came to university thinking probably I wanted to become a school teacher, but certainly a teacher. But I did well. Uh, at university, and the opportunity was very open in those days, in the early 60s, to become a university teacher. You got a star first, I knew, and um, was it a part one and part two at that time? It was, yes. So you got a first at part one and then starred first at I part think two. I got a star first in both. both. <laughs> uh, and then something very extraordinary happened to me, which is that Keyes College had the possibility of electing to a fellowship on TRIPOS results. It had mm. not Gosh. done that for some time, mm. but it did that in my case. And so I moved from being an undergraduate to being a fellow in one week at the age of 21. 
which was a very strange thing to happen. But a yet stranger thing happened to me in that summer, 1962, which stems from the fact that the Robbins Report on Higher Education, which was about to lift the level of the cohort being educated in the tertiary sector from 4% to 13%, had been enacted and the new universities were being set up. And as perhaps you remember, there was a big clean-out of people from Oxford and Cambridge in mid-career who went to start departments in other such universities. And Christ's College lost its official fellow in history. And I was appointed to that position. In fact, it's the position I've held ever since. And that happened uh, when I was still 21 in 1962. That's a very sort of pre-modern story to tell mm. about our educational system. It's the same story as my teachers, um, Keith. Thomas and James Campbell, both yes. um, you know, All Souls yes. Fellowship and then into a teaching fellowship. Yes. My difficulty was that I went at the age of 21 into a teaching fellowship. And that was one reason why I made a slow start on my research. I had very large responsibilities at that age. I had a lot of teaching responsibilities. I was directing studies. I was doing admissions. We still had the scholarship examination for which I was an examiner. All of this struck me immediately and it did mean that my research got off to a slower start than I would have liked. Mm. On the other hand, I had a tenured position from the age of 21 and they've still got me there. <laughs> <laughs> um, just returning to your undergraduate days a little more, were there any lectures? You mentioned Neil McKendrick as a supervisor, but were there either people who he farmed you out to or lectures you went to which you particularly recall as being influential and yes. magical? The general standard of lecturing, I remember, is rather dismal. And the course was uncongenial to me to a large degree because it consisted in those days of very large outline courses and a great deal of British politics concentrating on high politics. But there were two incandescent lecturers, uh, and one was Walter Ullmann, and the other was Moses Finlay. I was actually studying medieval intellectual history, and I couldn't always follow what Walter Ullmann was saying, but he gave off an incandescent sense that this mattered, and they were riveting lectures to hear. Moses Finlay was simply a remarkable lecturer. I was studying ancient history for part one, and he would go through very technical discussions, for example, about how you might estimate the size of the slave population. The whole thing was done entirely without notes and with a great effect of bravura about it. And he was a very handsome and spectacular presence on the mm. platform as well. But more than that, it was he who showed me that what you can say as an historian simply depends entirely on what the evidence is. And of course, he was talking about an era in which the evidence was fragmentary and conflicting, and gave one a wonderful sense of what the sources were, what they enabled you to say, where they conflicted, how you would interpret them. I found that quite tonic, and it wasn't really how we were being otherwise taught. But the other lecturer who was very important to me was Duncan Forbes, the intellectual historian. And in my final year, I did a course, which we still have as a course in the Faculty of History, called a Special Subject, which was two papers, and was really about half the whole course. And he was giving one on what he called the Scottish Enlightenment. Everyone calls it the Scottish Enlightenment now. But it centred very largely on the philosophy of Hume. And I was entranced by the course and by the philosophy of Hume, and it tremendously cemented my sense that I wanted to go on to do work in intellectual history, in the history of philosophy. I must also mention, although he was not a lecturer at the time, the person who supervised my work in political theory and intellectual history, John Burrow. He was then a research fellow at Christ's. He ended his career as professor of modern intellectual history at Oxford, and I'm still very much in touch with him. And he was a wonderful intelligence to be in touch with, very sceptical, very witty, very challenging, 
and not at all my kind of temperament, but someone whom it was very memorable to be talked by, and whom I still find it very memorable to discuss my work with. This wasn't the time when you first met Peter Laslett. He wasn't teaching political philosophy at that time. Was that later, was it? Well, Peter did give a course of lectures, mm -hmm. although he rather rarely remembered to turn up, as I recall. <laughs> On his day, he was a wonderful lecturer, mm -hmm. but he was chancy. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes he wasn't very interested in what he was lecturing about because he did a very wide outline course. Um, but when he was, then he was a very formidable mm -hmm. and very original person. Mm -hmm. Peter I never met when I was an undergraduate, but I would like to say that of all the pieces of secondary literature that I read when I was an undergraduate in the subjects that really were beginning to entrance me, probably the one that most struck me was his introduction to his edition of Locke. I remember going to be supervised by John Burrow in my second year, and John saying, because the week had come for an essay on Locke, he said, well, there's only one edition to use now, because it's at last been published, Peter Laslett's long promised definitive edition. So I went out and I bought it. It had just appeared, and I read it, and it was a genuine epiphany to me. Uh, and I can still recall the astonishment with which I read a text in which a major work of political theory was shown to be part of an ongoing political debate. Now Peter, when I subsequently talked to him about what he'd achieved in that remarkable edition, saw it in a way that seemed to me very strange. He thought that he had dethroned Locke from being a political theorist and had shown that he was only a pamphleteer. I had the a priori view, although it wasn't really a priori because I'd come to Cambridge armed with Collingwood, that probably what he said about Locke could be said for any work of philosophy. That if you could recapture it, there would always be an immediate context that made sense of the themes of the text. And that we should not be thinking of these texts in isolation from those contexts. And Collingwood's idea of a logic of question and answer clearly underpins that, and probably underpinned Laslett's thinking, I subsequently decided. But in any case, what Collingwood's idea left with me, in, even when I was an undergraduate, and there it was reinforced in Laslett's work, which has been a thought that's remained with me and very important to me ever since, is think of these texts as answers to questions. And the questions are going to be set by the society in which and for which the text is being written. So that part of the hermeneutic, part of the act of interpretation of the text, and I've come to feel the large part is the recovery not of what the text says, although of course it says things which can be endlessly debated, but of what the text is doing. What kind of an intervention does this text constitute in ongoing debates? I now say to my students over, for example, Hobbes' Leviathan, on which I'm giving a course at the moment, think of it as a speech in Parliament. It will be a very long speech, <laughs> but it's not inherently different from a speech in Parliament. That's to say, all of these great works of political philosophy are also recognisably to be placed on particular position on a political spectrum. They're recognisably contributions to a debate. Interpreting them is uncovering what that contribution was. That's what I thought Laslett did brilliantly for Locke. But it seemed to me strange that he thought that that was a demotion that showed he was still thinking in partly traditional terms. And I wanted to say, I think we could do this even for Hobbes, which of course had been Laslett's contrast. You couldn't do this for Hobbes. Mm -hmm. That's obviously an architectonic work which stands outside time and we appraise it uh, as, uh, simply as a masterwork. Some of my earliest historical research was on Hobbes, whom I treated as a theorist of obligation. And I wanted to show that that theory, and the reason that Hobbes foregrounded it in Leviathan, was because he was making a particular contribution to a debate about political obligation at the time that Leviathan was being composed. Had Peter 
already discovered the library by this time. I remember him telling me the detective story of discovering Locke's library. Yes. Um, I don't know whether that was after his edition or before it, or whether it had any effect on the edition if he had already discovered the library. He already discovered the library, and it was important to him. For example, one thing that was important to him was that the library did not contain a copy of Hobbes's Leviathan. Uh, of course, it's difficult with libraries because we all have books we haven't read, and we've all read books we haven't got. <laughs> but uh, that was important to Peter's interpretation because he wanted us to think of Locke as a reply to Filmer. He mm. thought it followed from that, but it couldn't be a reply to Hobbes. That, of course, is a non sequitur. Mm. But it was important to him what the contents of Locke's library were, and that was important in the edition. Subsequently, he did with Harrison an edition of the library. That's to say a catalogue. Mm. Yes, I remember. So you're still very young, 21, 22, and teaching very large um, numbers of students. Are there, I don't usually ask this, but are there any of your students who you would particularly recall and remember um, who went on in an interesting way or oh, yes. you learnt a lot from? Indeed. Uh, some of the students I taught in the 1960s were surpassingly brilliant and I've remained in touch with some of them since. That hasn't been so since then, because I don't think I was gifted as a supervisor, and I didn't very much enjoy it. I always found that my mood as a supervisor depended entirely on the mood of the student. So if the student was depressed with the course or didn't think it was very interesting, I immediately felt, well, maybe that's true. <laughs> I wasn't good at lifting people's spirits, so mm. I think I was best at teaching the really gifted. Um, of my students from that period, the two who became most famous and whom I remain in touch with ever since were, first of all, Roy Porter, whom I taught all the way through and also admitted to the college, who was, at all times, an extraordinarily formidable scholar, unbelievably hardworking and unbelievably wide-ranging, and died very young. The other from that period and I also admitted to the college and taught all the way through, is now the most famous historian in the world, Simon Sharma. <laughs> and he I've remained in touch with. It's a bit difficult to be in touch with Simon now because he's usually in an aeroplane. <laughs> but we email each other, and I've remained in touch with him. And nowadays one has to defend Simon, sometimes against one's professional colleagues. But he's a genius in his way. And he is a lord of language. He's also a lovely person. But I cannot continue the list. In the nature of things, the list will hardly contain a large number of really celebrated historians. But I stopped supervising quite early in my career at Cambridge. Because in 1974, I went on sabbatical leave to the Institute for Advanced Study at Princeton. And while I was there, they conceived the idea that I should remain there and gave me a five-year contract. And in the course of that five years, they invited me to stay forever. Now, I didn't stay forever, but I did accept the five-year contract. So I was actually in Princeton from 1974 through to 1979 and only returned to Cambridge, somewhat short of the end of my contract with the Institute uh, because I was elected to the Chair of Political Science here in Cambridge. And at the same time my wife was elected to a research fellowship at Girton and at the same time we were starting a family. So everything conspired to bring us back home. But when you say your wife, you may not want me to probe into this, but you'd been married before. Yes, I married very young. Um, I was 25 when mm. I married, although I married someone We'd been together for some time before that. But I think that quite soon we both found that we'd made a terrible mistake. She was mistake. my first publisher, Mrs. Patricia. Yes. She and I were married for a brief time. I suppose we were together for five or six years. But it, it, it was quickly evident to both of us, although I don't think that we were able to confess this even to ourselves, let alone to each other that it was not a good idea, but it was not a good idea and it didn't work. Mm. And 
Well, it came to pieces rather messily, and I left for Australia and was away for many months. I blame myself for that failed <laughs> marriage. But there's no more to be said about it except that after uh, some years when I was not attached or was semi detached, I met my present wife, Susan James, professor of philosophy at the University of London now. And we have been together. We haven't been married all this time. Uh, we got married when we started to have a family, but we've been together for about 35 or more years, and so of course it feels like a whole lifetime. Mm. And um, it has been wonderful. Mm. To return to, to um, Princeton, yes. you started in history and then moved into political sciences, yes. is that right? Yes, that's correct. Um, and your uh, page on whatever it is, Wikipedia, said this has had a great effect on you and was a very important turning point in your life. So in what way is that true? I'm sure they're quite well, I didn't know that. That's, that's an interesting claim. Uh, I was invited by John Eliot uh, to be a candidate for the position that I had from 74 to 75, which was in the history department. But during that year, I came to know very well the three really astonishing figures who were running the little social theory group there. And as history has continued to unfold, they have all turned out to be, as Hegel would say, world historical. And one was Thomas Kuhn, who was in the next office, whom I already knew, of course, through the structure of scientific revolutions, a work that had been very influential upon me, that kind of anti-Popperian, anti-positivist way of thinking about intellectual change. One was Albert Hirschman, whom I wasn't able to learn from directly. He was a development economist, but who was a picture to me of what it would be like to be a cosmopolitan intelligence. I never, of course, rivaled that, but he was a wonderful linguist, a wonderful intelligence. He knew everything about the history of art and literature and many languages. A stupendous figure. But perhaps the most important to me was Clifford Goertz, who became a lifelong friend and at whose memorial service I spoke last March in Princeton, enormously to my sadness. And his work on cultural theory was very important indeed to me. I should say that Cliff and I were both greatly influenced by Wittgenstein as a theorist of language and culture. And so I didn't learn as much as I might have learned from Cliff when I arrived at the Institute, because when I was an undergraduate, we all read Wittgenstein, and it was genuinely very, very important to me, and in the work on the philosophy of language, which I was publishing in the 1960s and early 70s, he was the heroic figure who stood behind much of what I was trying to say about the relation of understanding meaning in the traditional sense to understanding what is meant by what is said. That's really the fundamental move that is made in the philosophical investigations. And so I suppose what made Cliff and I into friends was that we so largely agreed about these <laughs> philosophical questions. Not, I think, because I was a disciple of his. Although, by the way, I think he is one of the most rivetingly intelligent persons I have ever encountered over a very wide range of subjects. And I was always very influenced by him. And I would always think, when I came back to England, of anything that was going on in American life. I wonder what Cliff would think about that. He was always a touchstone for me. But I became very close to him intellectually uh, and personally also. So that may be what this writer you mm. mentioned to me is speaking of. But I would say that what mattered to me most in those years that I was in Princeton was something rather different, which was that with a level of trust which shows that we're speaking of a more innocent and a better world, I was simply left to get on with whatever I was doing. Nobody particularly asked me what I was doing. They assumed I was probably writing a book. But it wasn't as if at the end of the year the director of the institute said, well, we've been paying you this fat salary, what, whatever have you been doing? But what, in fact, I was doing was I was trying to catch up, I think. I, I had done a lot of work in the 60s arising out of my philosophical interest that I'd come to the university with. And that work turned out to be 
in some cases quite influential. One of my essays, one I published in 1969, remains much my most cited piece, rather humiliatingly. And I eventually collected which, all which essays. Which piece was that? Yeah. It was an essay called Meaning and Understanding in the History of Ideas, a very Wittgensteinian yeah. essay. Yeah. Um, I eventually published all those essays in a book called Regarding Method. But that stopped me really getting going on historical research, along with the responsibilities I had. And although I began to do my research on Hobbes that I've already spoken about, that too only came out in the form of a number of articles. Eventually I published those as a separate book as well, called Hobbes and Civil Science. But neither of those are really proper books, they're collections of papers. But I had conceived in the late 60s, the idea of writing a really general work in the history of political theory, which would try to be an illustration of the view which was then fundamental to me, that interpretation is a matter of recovering what texts are doing, and thus situating them in the political context out of which they arose. And more fundamentally, I wanted to write a book which showed that the problems of political theory are set by politics, that we shouldn't make this distinction between political theory and political practice. Political theory is always enmeshed in practice, so that it's just the theory of that practice. So that was quite an ambitious book that I'd conceived. When I was first appointed as a lecturer in Cambridge, which was in 1965, I began to sketch those ideas in my lectures, working on a quite broad canvas, but I couldn't get it all to come together and the opportunity to go to Princeton in 1974 was, for me, the opportunity to write that book. And when I returned to Cambridge in 1979, and I imagine what must have got me the chair, was that I had written it. Uh, and I published it in 1978 in two volumes called The Foundations of Modern Political Thought, which was, in fact, my first book. But that was what was important for me about Princeton, that I was given the time, completely unharassed, simply to get on with writing something that was, by my standards, a very large piece of work. You mentioned uh, the people at Princeton who were in various fields, but none of them really in political theory or political history. Uh, but again, the Wikipedia person says you are one of the two members of the Cambridge School, famous Cambridge School, you are one, and J.G.A. Pocock is the other. So, was Pocock around then, or...? That's interesting. John Pocock was very important to my work from an early stage, because he was writing in the early 60s very interesting methodological pieces, which were very Collingwoodian. It was couched in a different way. Collingwood talks about how each text we study should be thought of as an answer to a particular question, as I've said. John talked about different texts having different levels of abstraction, but that, when I read it, also reinforced in my mind the thought that these works that we're studying are not all doing the same thing. We've got to try and find out what their underlying purposes are. I wanted the whole discipline to be more quantiliste. I wanted to be very nominalist about it. I wanted the unit of analysis to be a text and the context that enfolded it. John was already thinking along those lines. And what was very important to me was that in the late 60s, it may have been, or the early 70s, he sent me the entire, it wasn't a typescript, but it was a handwritten document, but it was the draft of his great text, The Machiavellian Moment, that was published in 1975. It was a great privilege to be sent this. And I was sent it because he had been attracted to the two bodies of work that I had by then published, my essays on Hobbes as a theorist of obligation and my essays on meaning and speech acts. He was interested in both of these. And he sent me this text to read. And that was very important for me as a, a wonderful scholarly statement of how to think about the development of Renaissance political theory. Now, the first volume of my Foundations of Modern Political Thought was called The Renaissance, and I trampled over much of the same ground. I came quite strongly to disagree with John, and I could go into why, if you liked, but I would, that text... I would like. <laughs> well, that text was very important 
Mm. Uh, and I was very privileged by John's generosity to have been able to internalize it long before it was published in 75. Mm. So it became part of my thinking. John Pocock and I have remained in touch ever since. And my most recent letter from him arrived last week. Uh, he's now in his 80s, but he is undiminished in power and energy. And he is a very formidable intellectual historian, and a very generous one too. He's obviously of a generation older than me, but he has always been someone who has treated me sort of as a peer, but at the same time has been a massive source of encouragement to me. But... <laughs> well, uh, when I worked first on Renaissance political theory, there were two orthodoxies that I was really interested in contesting, I suppose. And one was the view that there had been a tremendous shift, especially in the history of philosophy, and therefore in the history of political philosophy, at the time of the revival of Aristotelianism in the late 13th century. The other orthodoxy stated that there was another climactic moment, and notice this continuous habit of trying to make the Renaissance start with a bang in mm. Burkhartian vein, which placed the crucial date a century later. This was Hans Baron's fundamental thought in his classic text, The Crisis of the Early Italian Renaissance, where he saw the emergence of what he called a civic humanism, which was not Aristotelian, but which emerged, as I say, with a bang, around 1400, at the time of the crisis of the city-states, and especially the crisis of Republican Florence and Viscount de Milan. I came to think that both of those stories were wrong, but John Pocock, I think, had bought into the second story very much, although in the contribution that he generously made to the volume that was published uh, by Annabel Brett and James Tully in my honour, last year, he says this is not the case. But I must say that surprised me. It seemed to me that John's Machiavellian moment took the Hans Baron idea very seriously and began with a bang in 1400 and with civic humanism. What I have wanted to say about the development of moral and political philosophy in the Renaissance has always been the same thing since the 70s. And it's been the foundation of much of my research all of the way through since then, is that there was no happening with a bang what happened was that there was a kind of Roman culture that was never completely lost, and which by a process of accretion develops in the Italian peninsula with the emergence of the universities, with rhetoric being studied as a basis for understanding law, and law being the fundamental subject that was studied. And that this rhetorical and juristic culture, which was partially founded, of course, on the text of Roman law, but also incorporated all the major texts of Roman history and moral philosophy, was the curriculum that came to be known as the Studia Humanitatis, and that we can trace that right through from the 12th century, right through to the period of Machia Machiavelli and Guicciardini and later. And that was the book that I tried to write. So that was a very non pococcian sort of book. But for me, that was the beginning of what would be called a research program. That set of views that I arrived at really informed all my work for the next 25 years, and it's a program which I've only just succeeded in rounding off. Were you influenced by Southern, R.W. Southern at all, I mean his 12th century Renaissance, because in a sense he's saying that the Renaissance starts in the 12th century and not in the 14th, and that yes. the revival of universities and so on Absolutely. is a continuation. But yes. Did you come across his work? In of course. Time? Well, we all read The Making of the Middle Ages when mm. I was an undergraduate, and in a frankly, as I've said earlier, rather dismal landscape of medieval history, that shone as a beacon of extraordinary mm. imagination and intelligence, and of course it's also a wonderful piece of prose, mm. extraordinarily lucid. But it still had this idea that there has to be a moment which is the Renaissance, and really that's what I've been trying to contest. That Burkhartian image has died terribly hard. I've wanted to contest that all the way through. There's no moment. It's the gradual accretion of a humanist culture. And what interested me was the way in which, if you look at some of the great milestones,
of moral and political philosophy in the Renaissance, you can relate them back in different ways to this culture of Romanitas. The texts that were crucial were the texts of Livy and Sallust amongst the historians and to a lesser degree Tacitus, and among the philosophers, above all, Cicero and Seneca. That curriculum, as it were, more or less did it for you. And when I wrote my book on Machiavelli, which was the first book I wrote after the foundations of modern political thought, what I wanted to show is that the understanding of Machiavelli is the understanding of him as a kind of a Roman moralist. But he's also a satirist of some of those qualities that were admired. But the whole discussion of the relation of virtu to fortuna and virtu and fortuna to libertà, that whole discussion of freedom, virtue, glory that you find in Machiavelli, this is a recognizably Roman story. What's remarkable about Machiavelli is the satirical turn that he gives to some of that. So that was one moment in my research program. A later one uh, was the book I wrote about political painting in the early Renaissance, which had been understood entirely as an expression of scholastic values. And I worked in particular on the famous cycle of Lorenzetti in Siena, on which, as I say, I eventually wrote a book trying to show that the right way to interpret the context, the intellectual context in which this was written, was that this was a re recovery for a city republic in the mid Trecento of these Roman values about freedom and the common good and the relation of virtue to the promotion of freedom and the common good. And so I offered a reinterpretation, which I'm afraid has remained controversial, um, which wanted to say that these cycles have nothing to do with the recovery of Aristotelianism. They're all part of this humanist culture that I was seeing developing all the way through. I suppose the last part of that cycle of works that I wrote, which stemmed from the work I originally did in that first volume of the Foundations of Modern Political Thought, was that I became deeply interested in classical theories of freedom. Eventually I came to think that those theories differed in a really challenging way from the way in which we nowadays have tended to think about political liberty. And I became interested, first of all, in that rival way of thinking about it, and I wrote a, a little book on that, which emerged out of my inaugural lecture as Regis Professor here, which was my book called Liberty Before Liberalism. But I also became interested in the question, when did we stop thinking about liberty in this classical and very different way and start thinking about it in a more familiar way. And the book that I've just managed to finish is about that theme. But I, I've come to think that this insight, which is not exclusively mine, but which I've worked away at about these rival ways of thinking about freedom, has been the most important of the things that I took from my study of Roman antiquity and its influence in the Renaissance. Well, we'll come back to that because I am very interested in it. But to, just to finish off on Princeton, yes. was Lawrence Stone at Princeton? Are you familiar with Indeed, that? he was. He's running the Shalom, Shelby, Calum Davis Centre or whatever it's called. Yes, absolutely. He was um. an extremely powerful presence there. Mm. And I have two responses to the name of Lawrence Stone being mentioned. And one is to recall that he was very generous to me and my wife. They were very hospitable and they were very kind to us. But the other was that he was, although he would have denied it, still in his most Marxisant phase of thinking. I'm not sure he ever shook it off, really. And he thought that the kind of history that I was interested in was just absurd. There was no study of intellectual history that was going to be of any autonomous interest, because, because why? I think because Lawrence thought something like, you know, if you tell me your annual income and your class background, I'll tell you your beliefs. He must have thought something like that. He thought the whole thing was epiphenomenal with respect to some more real kind of history, which is what we ought to be studying. And he was not merely uninterested in what I was doing, he was sort of actively hostile to it. And that was the tone in the Department of History at the University of Princeton at the time. It likes to think of itself 
in retrospect as having been concerned in that period with cultural history in a Goetzean way. But that was not my experience of it. And I kept out of their way, which has always been my instinct, in fact. I've never really very much enjoyed talking about my work until I've done it. And I never once went to the Davis Centre seminars in all the years I was at Princeton. I just sensed, as soon as I saw the semester's list of what was going to be talked about, that it was going to make me miserable because they would all be talking about things that seemed to me, frankly, of very little interest. And they were going to take the view that what I was doing was of no interest. <laughs> and the best way of keeping one's spirits up and continuing to write this large book was just to sit in my office and write it. So just as I was a rather boring undergraduate in that way, I think, so I've remained a rather boring scholar in that way. I just like to get on with it.